Welcome, concrete friends. Today is an exciting day. We're going to be talking about the history of cement. Ha! Yeah, yeah. All the way from early, early ancient times through Roman cement, through modern cement. I know, exciting, right? Yeah, we're going to explain it all. We're going to talk about terminology. We're going to talk about the saga, the history, the drama of how the cement, modern cements were developed. All right, I gotta warn you though, there's gonna be some terminology along the way. There's gonna be some chemistry along the way. <gasps> chemistry, yeah, I know, it'll be okay. Don't worry, don't worry, stay with me. The history of cement. First and foremost, we need to start out with some terminology. That's way we make sure we're all on the same page. First, we're gonna talk about a hydraulic cement. That is a binder or glue that is stable in water. And that's the type of cement you want, one that's stable in water. Because if it's not stable, once it rains, it falls apart. That's not good. So if a hydraulic cement is stable in water, what do you think a non-hydraulic cement is? You got it. It's a binder or glue that is not stable in water. Wah, wah, wah. That's the one that's not as valuable not as much as what we're into. That's one that if you build your house out of and it rained, your house is going to be falling down. That's that's not good. Then this is a term called calcining. We're going to use calcining a lot. Calcining is to use heat to break apart chemical compounds. And there's a very, very classic version of calcining I'm going to talk about in just a second. First, let's start out talking about the ancient cements, the non-hydraulic cements. These were used by Egyptians, by the Greeks, by the early Romans as a cement. How did they make them? Well, they took limestone. What's limestone? It's a rock. Yeah, calcium carbonate, a rock. And they cooked it to about... 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, about, and they made lime and carbon dioxide. Yeah, carbon dioxide. This process is called calcining. And this carbon dioxide, this is the greenhouse gas that everyone's kind of scared about. Gas goes into the atmosphere, not around anymore. Used to be part of the rock. You cook, you cook, you cook. It's not there anymore. It floats away. All right, but it leaves lime behind. You take the lime, you add water to it, and you make something called slaked lime or calcium hydroxide. This is like a slurry, okay? And these calcium hydroxide crystals, we'll talk more about calcium hydroxide coming up. They're plate-like, and I'm drawing it as like a big plate, but it's not big. No, it's big underneath maybe a scanning electron microscope or a really, really high-power optical microscope. These things are maybe 20 microns in size. 20 microns, how big is that? Mm, it's about half the size of a human hair, about, okay? A little bit less than that. But with enough water and mixing, this calcium hydroxide is actually soluble in water. So you get this slurry. You make this slurry of material and you glue stuff together like bricks or stones or whatever you want. And then once it sits out, it absorbs carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Yeah, I know, pretty cool, right? Yeah, it absorbs it. And what does it make? It makes calcium carbonate. It makes what you started out with and water. That water usually evaporates and goes away, but this is left as a solid. So as the material dried, it truly gains strength. And when you hear people say concrete's drying, 
If we're talking about modern concretes, that's not true. That's not true. Concrete hydrates. I'll talk more about that coming up. But old ancient cements, that's what they did. They did dry, right? They did. As they gained carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they would form a solid limestone and then the water would evaporate off. They actually formed artificial rock. They could cast stone. Ha! Pretty cool. But sadly, this limestone is soluble in water. Remember? That's the non-hydraulic cement. That means if it rained, it wouldn't it would fall apart. Good thing it doesn't rain in Egypt, right? Or very often. This limestone is soluble in water, so the cement could not be used in high moisture environments. This is helpful and good, but not exactly what you want. This material also took a long time to gain strength for it to be usable. It's another thing that just doesn't lend itself to rapid modern construction. But those Romans, they're pretty clever cats. They came up, they're the first ones to actually develop hydraulic cements. Remember, those are the cements that set and are not soluble in water. You can actually use them in water if you want. That's amazing. That's really powerful. So the Romans needed a cement that was durable in water. So they made mixtures of lime. That's the same stuff I was just talking talking about. And volcanic ash. Where do you get that from? A volcano, right? After it's already like erupted. You basically mine or dig up the sides of it. You mix it up with your lime. And again, you, you, you take this limestone and you cook it to get lime and carbon dioxide. This is again calcining. Remember calcining? This is calcining. And this carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. Yikes. But then you take this lime and you mix it up with this reactive silicon dioxide from the volcanic ash. You basically take the lime and, and the volcanic ash and then you cook that. So you've, you've had to cook it twice. And you end up making a calcium silicate. Now you notice I have an X and a Y here and an X and a Y here because we don't really know the Roman recipe. We don't really know how much quicklime they used and how much volcanic ash they used, but it's likely that they didn't, that this reaction produced some calcium silicate and there was actually probably some volcanic ash left over, okay? So not all of volcanic ash was used up in this reaction and some of it was probably available for further reactions. Anyway. This makes something called a calcium silicate, right? Some kind of calcium silicate. So we take this calcium silicate and we add water to it and it makes something called the calcium silicate hydrate. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Roman cements and this is actually a, a kissing cousin to our modern cements. Some, some definite similarities here. Calcium silicate hydrates are the glue that we use in our modern cements. It is the good stuff formed in our modern cements, and we're pretty sure, and other, ex other experiments have shown that the Romans produced it as well. Calcium silicate hydrate, also known as CSH. We're simple people in the world of cement, and we like to shorten things. This is cement chemistry shorthand. Every time you see calcium oxide, we call it C in cement chemistry language. Every time you see silicon dioxide, we call it S. Okay, this really ticks off the chemists. They get so upset and we just think it's funny. And then there's water, H2O, and we just call it H. Ha! They think this is carbon, sulfur, and hydrogen, but not to cement chemists. This is calcium silicate hydrate. This is the good stuff. This is what we're all about, CSH. And the best source of volcanic ash in the world, the best source that the Romans knew about was in Pozzoli, Italy, right? This reaction was therefore named Pozzolanic. And any minerals that led to these reactions are called Pozzolans. 
These hydraulic cements were used on several major projects that are still in existence today. Let's take a look. This is the Roman aqueducts. This is what the Romans used to build, to take water from miles away from their cities and bring them in, bring them in, bring them in to the city center where they could drink from it, bathe in it, do all kinds of things in it. When you can control and produce fresh water, that is really powerful for a civilization. But how would I make these? I'm gonna, these things actually transport water. Yeah, yeah, there's actually water carried in these channels. And in this channel right here, there's water that actually goes in there. If I made this with a non-hydraulic cement, the water itself would cause and make it to collapse. The Romans had to have a hydraulic cement just like the ones I was talking about before. But they didn't just build aqueducts, right? Romans built all kinds of things, like the Colosseum. This is like their big amphitheater, where they had battles, and they actually had sea battles inside of here, all kinds of crazy stuff with monsters and humans fighting. The Colosseum, like our modern sports stadiums. Also, their temples. This is the Pantheon. Again, built with Roman concrete, lasting over 2,000 years. It's pretty amazing, right? And then the baths of Karkala, okay? These are huge public baths where, where they would go and bathe and hang out. Again, all made with Roman concrete. Those Romans, pretty clever cats, right? There's a big problem, though. There's a big problem with these cements. Volcanic ash isn't available everywhere. you got to be near a volcano. Also, when they were digging it out of the volcano, it's quite variable. As in, one area may produce great cement, and another area would produce horrible cement. That's a problem. So, the cement is variable. You had to have an actual volcano. Another bad thing is the strength gain took months, months. They wouldn't be able to use these structures for months after being built, but they were long lasting. There were very little improvements in the cement technology during the Dark Ages. Actually, not much technology at all developed during the Dark Ages, except for weapons, I guess. But about 1,800 years later, during the Industrial Revolution, demand was again increased for a hydraulic cement. This is in England now. They're really pushing for this. France as well. The first thing they did is they studied what the Romans did, and they looked at this volcanic ash, and they said, you know what? Maybe we could use clay or shale or slate. Okay, The silicon dioxide was in this form, kaolinite had aluminum in it as well. Think of it as like tile. But it's not as reactive as this ash, so more heat was required. Again, but more heat, what's that going to mean? That means more energy. More energy means it costs more. It costs more for the environment to make, but it's what they needed to do. So they took the quick lime. They got this SiO2, silicon dioxide, they cooked it at a higher, higher temperature, and they were able to produce dicalcium silicate. Dicalcium silicate. And this, in cement chemistry shorthand, is known as C2S, or also known as B-Lite. B-Lite. This solved the problem of the availability of the volcanic ash. But again, the cements took months months to gain strength and that just wasn't what people wanted so in 1824 an english mason named joseph aspidin was actually awarded a patent for something called portland cement and this name was given to the product because it resembled the prestigious um cliffs of portland the prestigious portland stone let me show you a picture of that. This is the 
Portland stone. This was highly sought after, known as super high quality. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could sell somebody a bag that you would mix up with water that would make a stone that looked like this? This was, oh my gosh, people wanted this. And Joseph Aspidin was an amazing marketer. He was actually way better marketer than he was a mason and way better marketer than he was a cement manufacturer. Let me tell you why. The reason why I said he was such a better marketer than he was a cement manufacturer was because the cement, at least as it's written in his patent, because lots and lots of people have tried to develop it, it didn't work. It didn't work. It's kind of crazy that the guy that basically gave the name Portland Cement, and all modern cements are Portland Cements. They're called that, Portland Cements. That name from Joseph Aspidin, his formula didn't work. It didn't. But in 1840, Joseph's son, William Aspidin, actually solved this problem. He, he actually finally made a material that would gain strength at a rapid rate by using a larger amount of lime and higher temperatures. So he used more lime, higher temperature, and he produced something called tricalcium silicate. Did he know what he was doing? No. He was just trying stuff. He got lucky. He produced tricalcium silicate, which we call C3S. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is also called a -Lite. And this, this is the building block, the main reactive component of our modern cements today.